While Christians have been persecuted since the inception of the church, one person recently observed that I heard and read about that more Christians percentage-wise are suffering persecution for their faith in Christ at this time in history than in any other time. In fact, almost every other week, you know, you, you read in the news, see in the news of uh, some Christians somewhere around the world that are suffering. Maybe you heard most recently of the burnings of the Christian churches and Christians' homes there in India. And I, I put a link at the bottom of our email here. Dude, you can go read about that, just one of the current ones. I also ran across a report from Open Doors 2023 World Watch List. And in that report, more than 80% of the world's population live in countries where religious freedom is highly or severely restricted. The report also said about 360 million Christians face severe persecution for their faith right now. And then they also said the number of Christians who have been killed for their faith has risen 80% in the last five years. That's significant. And their reports also a link at the bottom of this uh, uh, video in the email that you saw the thing. Added to all this are the thoughts about Jesus' return and what prophetic scripture seems to indicate. Well, times will get a little tough at the end. I'm not talking about the tribulation. That's evidently going to be tough, but many feel that the tough times might start here before the rapture. In fact, Paul says, 2 Timothy 3, Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. Wow. How should we respond? How do we relate to the possibility of persecution? Well, welcome to Calvary Conversations. Sort of sound like a downer entry, but I, I'm Mike Dodds, and my I'm the host for today's conversation with Pastor Reed Wagner, author of this book, Preparing for Persecution. And he's got that sitting behind him there on the shelf. Welcome to the conversation, Pastor Wagner. Thank you so much for having me today. You bet. Glad to have you here. We met this last summer at a church convention, and uh, I picked up a copy of your book at that time. And as soon as I picked it up, I go, just maybe out of my own life, I'm going, ah, wow, I, I want to read a little bit more about it. And I want to be able to share how to prepare for persecution with others. So your title was very captivating. Having read it, I'm convinced that anyone that picks up that book, your book there, uh, and I'm, I'm really saying it, it's a good, fair examination of what scripture says what scripture says you're doing a biblical study in all the chapters about how to, you, you want to encourage us how to prepare for persecution now you're a graduate of appalachian bible college shepherd's theological seminary now the you're the a, a pastor of worship at berea bible church in springfield ohio and as you just said you're a church planter with the uh Midwest Church Extension of Fank, you're the East Region Field Director. So you're a church planner about to start a church. How soon is the kickoff? When That's is that right. going to happen? October 1st of this year of 2023 is uh, our launch date, and we're very, very excited about uh, seeing what God's going to do here in Springfield, Ohio. For you and your family, and you just mentioned to me your family's expanding, so you're you're, you're expanding the, the, the workers right. for the field. <laughs> that's great, but that's, that's another right. topic we're here to, to talk about today. Now, you're a worship and music pastor, but I've got to say, this is not a worship book, so don't get it for that. Uh, uh, but yet, it calls us to worship, so I, I could maybe put that in there. You cover 12 topics that are relative to the topic of persecution. And in each chapter, I like at the end that you put study questions to help us to process that. And boy, you, you've structured it so it could be used in a Sunday school class, perhaps, or just helped us as readers to process it. To answer the the implied um, question of your title, how can we prepare for persecution? And your subtitle here, and you have a subtitle with every chapter, uh, the subtitle here in the front, Embracing a Biblical Mindset. And that's a term you refer throughout. And as I mentioned, it's really a biblical study about different aspects of persecution. But let, let's start square one. Why'd you write it? Uh, you're a worship pastor. You didn't write something about music. What, what, what did it come well, out of, Reed? I, I've certainly worn a lot of hats when it comes to ministry. <laughs> I've been a solo pastor before, done worship music, and okay. so a lot of a lot of different things. But really, the the impetus for writing the book came from just conversations that I was having with people in church, as well as other church leaders, 
who increasingly were talking about the reality of persecution. And I feel like w once upon a time, we always kind of said, oh, this is America, it couldn't happen here. Mm -hmm. uh, but more and more as we see kind of the, sh the shifting winds of culture, uh, more and more folks were talking about what do we do if it happens here? Mm -hmm. And uh, as you mentioned, we tried to be a biblical study because I'll be honest, I don't have, I, my experience is like most American Christians. My exposure to persecution is minimal. I'm not any more persecuted than most other American Christians. Like you mentioned already, uh, so many believers around the world are subjected to intense persecution. But in the U.S., we're pretty insulated from that. We haven't had to deal with the really, uh, really intense type of persecution before. And what the question really to me was, well, what do we do? Because I hear folks talk about persecution and talk about uh, you know, what's coming uh, for the church in America. And I always wonder, well, what do we do with that? Is the answer just be afraid or um, you know, hide under a log somewhere? And instead I said, well, well what could we do practically? And that's, that is the uh, question of the book is, is there anything we can do to prepare? And I answer mm. yes. And it's basically by putting on that biblical worldview, that biblical mindset. Mm. Mm. So that's what we tried to do in the book was to, to lay out chapter by chapter areas where our mindset needs to shift if we're going to withstand persecution like those faithful Christians in ages past and around the world who stand firm for Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in your chapter 12, at the very end, uh, you, you say something like this. You're reading this book most likely because you're concerned about the direction of our culture and the swelling tide against biblical teaching and morality. Now, I, uh, you, you, you're, you're not a prophet, and this is not a book about prophecy. Rather, you're saying, I don't know what God's got going on, but if it got tough, how would I respond? Um and and so it doesn't just apply to prophetic themes of persecution. It applies to any tough place in life that we would have to deal with it. I, a couple of your titles, we're not going to go through every title of the chapters that you have here, but a couple of chapter titles, Live as Exiles, you know, that's sort of your exhortation there with your title, Consider Christ, Rewarded at Last, talking about spiritual rewards, Love the Persecutor, Be Strong and Courageous, Yeah. As you wrote the book, uh, Pastor Wagner, uh, what was the the chapter or the topic out of all these that you really felt, oh, I got to get this down? You were excited about it. It was sort of easier for you to, because it just had been processing. Uh, excited maybe sounds a little bad. You know, you were excited to talk about persecution. No, <laughs> but there was something that was burning your heart. You know, was there something in one of these chapters that were a little more than others? I think so. And, and again, even with the chapters, um, you're right. I'm not I'm not trying. In fact, I avoid making predictions or projections about what might happen. I just simply say in the book, if things continue to go where we see they're going right now, uh, where does it all lead? And uh, the chapters in particular, I tried to pick areas where I think as Americans, our mindset doesn't always align closely with the Bible. So probably the one chapter that to me was, again, it's hard to say most fun to write, but uh, yeah. the whole topic of a biblical view of life and death. And, you know, you look mm -hmm. at Paul, his life, and for instance, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says there, you know, I don't count my life as worth anything at all, except that I run my race for Christ. Uh, and so you look at Paul's attitude there, and in Philippians 1 is another great example where he talks about uh, you know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And that whole idea of seeing the proper biblical perspective of life is a beautiful, wonderful gift God's given us to use for his glory. But death is not something we ought to live in shuddering fear over. Mm. That uh, we, we can and should give up our lives joyfully if Christ calls us to do so. And so to have that kind of perspective, again, I think as Americans, we've kind of inherited that we have the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that our life is of supreme importance. And mm. that's not the attitude that Paul had. That's not the Christian attitude towards life and death. 
And so I, I was a lot of, uh, I enjoyed being able to take those statements from Paul and from the New Testament and be able to kind of spell out of what is a Christian view of life and death and how does that change the way we think about persecution? Yeah, in your sixth chapter, Living as Exiles, you, you say these words, perhaps the current climate of American society has exposed a flaw in our Christianity. We have been too at home in this world. Oops, true, how do you see? What would you say to us? Yeah, that's. I think that's it. Uh, that um, instead of living like the Bible says, we're sojourners, strangers and pilgrims in this world and our, our eternal home is yet to come. Instead, we've become pretty pretty accustomed to life, especially because we have so many, uh, so many benefits, so many uh, comforts as Americans. Mm. Uh, life is pretty easy. Uh, but when you look at the attitudes of the persecuted, both historically and, uh, you know, mm. globally, uh, you see people whose treasure and whose home is eternity. And they, they treasure and love Christ. They treasure and love the gospel. And uh, they're looking for the, their future home. So mm -hmm. living as strangers and pilgrims in this world is really the mindset we ought to have. We ought to see our home as heaven, as what God has prepared for us, and not necessarily first as Americans, but rather mm -hmm. first as Christians. Yeah, yeah. I, I teach a class called Great Christian Thinkers, and there are different iterations of the course, and one time I teach it, I focus on the early church fathers, and they knew persecution like we don't. And, and just to be fair to us all, you know, we, we've been really blessed here in the West in America for not much persecution, and but that's not really been the history of God's people, has it? Um, and at, at the early church fathers, they really knew it. They had to argue for the faith, but they also had to argue for legitimacy, you know, because they were being persecuted. You make a, well, another point. As someone who's not experienced a great deal of persecution, uh, that was one of my my real sources to draw upon. I looked back at uh, mm -hmm. you know, Fox's Book of Martyrs and some of the attitudes and the mindsets that those individuals had when they went through persecution. And so I was able to pull some of those into the book, just stories here and there scattered throughout. Uh, because again, I think they give us a really good idea of what what kind of what kind of worldview, what kind of uh, manner of thinking leads to faithfulness in the midst of suffering? Yeah. And we have so many excellent examples throughout church history. Hmm. I, I like what you just said it, and it's throughout the book with each title, the mindset that I need to have, and how do you cultivate that? Let me ask a sort of an opposite question. You know, what was sort of the easiest? It, it just, you had to get it out. What was one of the hardest chapters you think for you and again it's just a personal thing but you know as you sat down and write it go ah i don't know i don't know if i'm ready to write this or i'm not ready to know if ready people ready you know what was, what was the di most difficult part of the book writing about preparing for persecution there was probably a couple of a couple of different ones but I, towards the end of the book i think it's maybe chapter 11 there's a chapter on uh, joyful suffering and suffering with joy. And that whole concept, you know, James mm -hmm. talks about it in James chapter one, you know, count it all joy, brethren, when you face various trials. And wow, it's, that's hard to get your head around. And it's not just in James, it's all over the place in the Bible. You'll see this mm -hmm. intersection of suffering and joy. And it's not hard to, I mean, it's easy to read on a page, but really to to get your head and your heart around that idea of, wow, we are indeed blessed if we suffer for Christ. We and the joy that we can and should have, uh, to me, was it was a bit of a challenge, uh, just to my heart, even just to kind of put that on paper and and say, wow, is this would I would I really count it joy if mm -hmm. I lost everything, if yeah. uh, my reputation and my uh, you know, career or, or whatever else. Uh, again, I, I share in the book uh, real briefly, I forget which chapter, but uh, when I was in college, I really had a, a sort of uh, moment where I asked myself the question. I don't even remember what prompted it. I just remember asking, I, am I willing to go to jail for preaching the gospel? Mm -hmm. And that was, that was kind of a stop in your tracks kind of moment for me. And um, you know, 
here, this, it's been a number of years since I was in college, and uh, obviously the Lord has allowed me to continue preaching that gospel message. I haven't ended up in jail yet, but uh, I think the question is always kind of there in my mind. Am I willing to, to go to jail for mm-hmm. preaching this message? And I think it's something that uh, we need to think about. Yeah, we, we just recently have seen in, in the news people that were out in different contexts. I hope they were saying it graciously, but they were standing out, meaning I, I don't know how they said it, but they were proclaiming the truth and they got arrested, you know, for different reasons, different countries. In in that chapter, you talked about joy. Here's an interesting comment. Only by consciously and deliberately choosing the mindset of joy will we be prepared for whatever difficulty we may be called to endure. Wow, that's true. And what is joy? How would you define it? Is it ha ha laugh laugh? No, it's not. What's joy in persecution? I think I think joy comes from that deep abiding knowledge of God's presence with us, and uh, really the in in a sense there is a a real happiness that comes from knowing and doing God's will. Uh, and again, it's it's yeah, joy is. Is deeper. It's not connected to circumstances, because I mean, even Paul talks about his joy that he has uh, while in chains. You know, Philippians mm-hmm. again is such a great little book. You know, it's mm-hmm. people oftentimes talk about the theme of joy being at the top of uh, the many themes that are kind of woven into Philippians. And I mean, it's a it's a book that's just full of sunshine in terms of Paul's mm-hmm. attitude, and yet he's in prison. He's mm-hmm. changed the gospel. And so it's not tied to circumstances, but it is tied to our relationship and our, our I think, our knowledge of God and following him and his will. Mm-hmm. In that same chapter, you make this statement, persecution creates an environment in which Christians learn, uh, learn about and experience God in a way they could not otherwise. What do you mean? Well, and I think that's exactly when Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted. Um, we think to ourselves, that doesn't sound very blessed. I mean, I certainly, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't no. say, hey, I'm having a blessed day if I was being persecuted. But I think that's where, that's why, is because there's there's a sense in which we're sharing with the sufferings of Christ. When we're persecuted for righteousness sake, when we're persecuted for the gospel, uh, we're able to share in the in the sufferings of Christ and to really experience that fellowship with him in a, in a new way. And I think that's why it's blessed. And uh, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, I think have a blessedness that we sometimes don't experience because we've never been to that point where you have nothing else to cling to, but God. And mm. uh, I think that's, it's a good thing, uh, mm. even though it's a tough thing. Oh, wow. Doesn't seem good if we use that word in a, one sense, does it? Or... In, in chapter seven, you say this, if we desire to suffer for Christ, we must learn to suffer like Christ. How did Christ suffer that we need to take and emulate? That is such a good question, because I think when you look at the Gospels and all four Gospels have the account of Jesus on trial and and really not just in his trial, but throughout Jesus life, you see people harassing him and, and lying about him and mistreating him in a number of different ways. So when you look at the example of Christ, it's really telling and how and how he treats others, because he treats others with grace over and over again. Um, even as he's on the cross, he says of those who are crucifying him, well, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so you have this overwhelming sense of, of grace that almost seems impossible to imitate. Mm. I think it would be were it not for the Holy Spirit and God's grace at work in our lives. Um, but we see, yeah, his, his, his attitude of grace. You see his quiet submission to the Father all throughout Jesus' life, but particularly in those last hours leading up to the cross. Uh, you see that he's committing himself and committing his whole situation to God. And instead of kind of arguing about it and fighting about it and trying to, you know, make a a defense or trying to somehow avoid. Now, we understand that Jesus' death on the cross had a very uh, theological significance, Mm -hmm. but uh, 
still that attitude of quiet submission to the Father, entrusting himself to a, a righteous creator who governs all things. And so I think it's really, uh, I think that'd be a great place to start if you say, hey, I'm, I'm really wondering, how do I prepare for persecution? Study the life of Christ. Get mm -hmm. to know how he responded to those who hated him and who uh, hurt him and abused him. And I think that that gives you a nice blueprint to begin with and say, is is my attitude towards this whole topic, is my attitude towards those who would who would harm me like that of Jesus? Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, speak to the person who perhaps, you know, we, we say here in America, we've not really experienced persecution, and that's true compared to people around the world. Uh, speak to someone who yeah, that's just not a reality. I'm not being persecuted for my faith in Christ. Are the how are the things I know they do? How are the things that you're talking about in this book preparing us for? And I could use a different word than persecution for suffering and and for just just the inequities of life. And I say that meaning you know life is not perfect for all of us. Um, these mindsets apply to those things too, don't they? Absolutely. In fact, if you wanted to just sweep the whole topic of persecution away, the books, mm -hmm. I think all we're talking about is putting on a biblical worldview, yeah. thinking Christianly mm -hmm. about ourselves and about the world and about God. And so I think that's our duty as believers is to, to think biblically, to think Christianly about um, all of these things. So even if we're not being persecuted, these are still essential areas but I think there are areas where we tend to be, as Americans, I think weak on, um, because just because we haven't had to experience many of those things. Mm -hmm. So, and then the other thing I, I would say in that scenario is, yeah, we may not be persecuted now, and it may not even come in, in your lifetime or mine. Um, but since we don't have insight into what's the next thing on the calendar, um, the time to prepare is now. You, you, can't, you can't wait till the police are knocking at your door and saying, hey, listen, if you preach the gospel, you're coming with us. Uh, you can't wait till that moment and say, oh, I better pull out a notebook and take a quick uh, take some notes here on how I should respond. And that's the thing I found so often as I looked at Fox's Book of Martyrs or other um, folks who so courageously and valiantly suffered for Jesus is their whole lives were built up to that moment. It's not like they just started following Christ on the way to the scaffold or on the way to the cross. They were following Christ faithfully and uh, courageously year after year, even through the mundane things. They were cultivating a kind of relationship with Jesus that was able to uphold them. And that, that relationship and, and fellowship with Jesus mm -hmm was their strength and bulwark whenever they were in the suffering. So don't wait until it's knocking at the door. The time to prepare is now. Yeah, yeah. We use the imagery as you're talking there. I was thinking of athlete, athletics where we talk about muscle memory. You know, an athlete has to condition their body to respond correctly, whether it's gymnastics or something like that. And there's a sense of what you're describing. We need to have a spiritual muscle memory. And that that's developed over just the regular part of life so that when we get into the test or into the trial, you know, we're ready. In your final chapter, you know, we're, we need to wrap our conversation down. And I want to focus on what you're saying there, you know, that you, you, you're concerned about the culture, but you talk about practical things. I mean, there's where you talk to the church leaders and you talk to individuals, just like we're saying here, how could you prepare? And you end with a modeling the mindset as a sub title at one section talking about Daniel and his free th three friends. And I, I like you list four things here. First, what they, Daniel and his friends said, persecution's no great surprise. Mm. Comp second, compromise was not in their vocabulary. Third, they were willing to die. And fourth, they conducted themselves with winsome grace. You, you challenge us as church leaders to help our people to do those kinds of things. Speak to that practical element. What what can we do? Or maybe we're speaking to a church leader, like to say, "Hey, I'd maybe like to pick up Reed's book and you know think of how to how to help our people to become stronger before the fact." Yeah. Well, and I, I use the the example of Daniel and those the Hebrews and 
Babylon because I think they they really embody the whole package of thinking biblically about themselves and um, and I think number three on that list especially hits me because the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are tossed into the fiery furnace, but we know that they're rescued. So it almost feels a little bit like, oh, well, since we know mm-hmm. the end of the story, but don't miss that they were, they didn't know they were going to be rescued when they were mm-hmm. tossed in. Um, so yeah, I, and I wanted to end on something practical because I realized that it can feel a little abstract talking about biblical mindset and worldview and these sorts of things. So concretely, what can we do? Mm-hmm. And I think that there's, I think there's a number of steps and, and that I'm certainly not comprehensive or um, complete in that. There's certainly a lot you could add to that chapter, no doubt. But um, you know, even talking to churches about how do you prepare, I think one way is through teaching these topics. Yeah. I, I, anybody who preaches through the word in a kind of linear way, uh, sooner or later is going to come to the topic of persecution. And uh, I think many people have preached on it and taught on it. Um, but sometimes not connecting the dots between it's sort of, oh, that's what they experienced back then. But what lessons does it teach us for today? Mm-hmm. And so that was, again, that was even part of the point of writing the book is to just give Christians a resource to talk about persecution in a way that's helpful, in a way that's not just doom and gloom, you know, woe is us, persecution is coming, but to say, what do we do? What, what can we practically start implementing in our lives that's going to help us in the long run. So I, I would love for churches to get a hold of the book and, and do it as a small group study or a Bible study just to start the, the conversation, just to talk about this topic and start thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, on the individual level, I think obviously putting on that biblical mindset is where it all starts. But I think there's other practical things too, just developing that relationship with the Lord. I mean, that's kind of Christianity 101, but it's also so needful that we're growing in that kind of relationship so that when troubles come, we're not, uh, we're not caught off guard, but rather we have, we've developed that relationship where we're walking with God. Uh, memorizing scripture is another one that I point out in there that, uh, you know, the heart that's filled up with scripture is a heart that's ready to face suffering. And, uh, it's, you know, in the age when we have Bible on our phone and everything, it's still so valuable to commit scripture to memory and be able to hide it in your heart because through that process, you're, you're really internalizing the truth. So, yeah, yeah there's a lot of things yeah. like that that are just practical ways to help us be better prepared for what's to come. Yeah, yeah you say that one. It just reminded me, I'm, I'm a former Air Force pilot. And it came in at the end of Vietnam, didn't go to Vietnam to fly there. But reading the stories of the prisoners of war that were there in the Hanoi Hilton, one of the things they did when they were in solitary confinement, they would take something they could tap on the walls in Morse code so they could communicate, have human contact. And what they would tap would be scripture verses. They they had memorized. And so they were just sharing. And I don't remember that verse. And they'd share the word so scripture memory in persecution how valuable so so many examples well we're, we're out of time i wish you had more time to talk um uh, pastor wagner thank you for your encouragement for how to deal with persecution it's our prayer and now i'm speaking to our audience that uh, just our conversation here today the two of us is not only uh, encourage you to to find some resources maybe reads book or others where you can be encouraged how to prepare it the right biblical mindset or whatever the Lord has in our lives, but also to encourage others that are going through that. Read, I put your book, a link down at the bottom there to find on Amazon. Um, any other comments that you'd like to say about the book before we go? Well, I, I think uh, one thing that we we maybe haven't touched on so much, and that's just realizing the reality um, mm. that you know, Jesus, as I think you pointed out at the very beginning, Jesus said, if in this world you'll have tribulation, mm. and he told disciples flatly if they hated me they're going to hate you and so i don't think saying oh that couldn't happen that's that's not a good answer just saying oh that that'll never take place in my lifetime i I don't think that's a responsible way to to even handle the scriptures because jesus said we're gonna we're gonna suffer and so um, praise god that we've 
with so many of us have avoided that so far and haven't experienced that. But yeah, just looking for it. But also to have an optimistic view as well. And that is we're, we're not, we don't face persecution as those who are you know, trembling in fear, but as those who are courageous in Christ, as those who have incredible hope, as those who are bought of God and belong to him, there's, we've got a wonderful future ahead. Persecution or not, we have a wonderful future. And um, I think I think we need to talk about persecution in a way that's not just hopeless, not just dread and gloom, but is full of joy and hope. So hopefully the book will encourage people to have those conversations. You bet. Great. Well, thank you for sharing today, Pastor Wagner. And thank you that's all right. of us for joining us today. Join us again next week for another Calvary Conversation. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Calvary Conversations, a service of Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri. We invite you to participate in the conversation by contacting us through the Calvary University website, calvary.edu, or by calling us at 816-322-0110. Join us again next week for another Calvary Conversation.